afternoon, welcome to UK Column News. It is the 18th of March 2015 and it's just gone one o'clock. Myself, Louise Collins, Brian Gerrish and Nick are here in Plymouth. And uh, we have Mark Anderson joining us midway through the show with um, some reports from across the pond. Absolutely. That was a report that was done yesterday, uh, which we're playing out today. Um, that's due to the time differences to make it convenient for us. But uh, Mark Anderson will be a regular contributor to the UK Column News. Uh, well, just a quick mention of the daffodils, because they are, of course, popping up all over the place. What's the cause? Sunshine. Um, we've got an extraordinary situation of sunshine in Plymouth, in Manchester, in the northeast, in Pembrokeshire. It's only Essex that apparently is under a little bit of a cloud. So there we are. You're off first. Indeed. Well, um, we reported a little while ago that the BBC was planning an expose panorama series looking at uh, people who dared to put out alternative media to their own propaganda. And uh, we were given a specific alert that the panorama programme was going to work to undermine activists who have been reporting and campaigning on the subject of child abuse. Well, we were intrigued today to... Uh, be given a little bit more information and the word on the streets is that uh, Kerry Thomas, the um, head of the Panorama team, uh, has effectively been told that the BBC doesn't really have the confidence to put out that Panorama programme because it could actually backfire on the BBC and undermine their reputation. So this was um, an article that uh, we posted a little while ago on the UK Column website. Here we are, Panorama and the BBC cover-up of child abuse. Remember, of course, that it has only been the UK column that has been exposing that the BBC pulled its reporters off child abuse at Oxford and Cherwell Valley College. And now here we are. This is what we understand, uh, that the BBC has got cold feet and is beginning to realise that uh, it's not a good idea to go poking a stick amongst people who are trying to expose the child abuse rings. They're running away, aren't they? And they're scared. Well, I believe there's a lot of scared people in Westminster at the moment. Uh, politicians, very, very squeamish. Theresa May making some quite bizarre statements, which we'll come on to later in the programme. And I'm going to say many police officers who've been a little bit too close to the child abuse issue, of course, getting very frightened uh, because to go to prison uh, not only as a paedophile, but a police officer, very, very uh, dangerous sentence. So we understand that uh, there are, at the moment, there's ructions in Westminster. Of course, David Cameron, we've reported, has apparently called upon the military police uh, to defend him. And we've got naval ratings being trained in close protection. Um, David Cameron's looking very tired and drawn at the moment. Could it be as the... Uh, as the circle of the child abuse investigations closes in on central government. Well, we need to do everything we can to help good people who've been out there um, posting the truth and also campaigning to get the truth out into the public domain. Chris Spivy, who we have mentioned before, needs our help. Uh, on Friday, he's due to appear at two o'clock in Southend Magistrates Court. Um, we're saying, please, can you support him? Uh, because following his mm. reports on Lee Rigby, the British state has tried to close him down. And of course, they're now using their favourite tactic. If you don't do as we say and shut up, we are going to take your children. Or grandchildren. In, yeah. this, in this case, grandchildren. So um, please, uh, if you're in the London area, uh, see whether you could get to that uh, magistrate's court in order to support and show solidarity with Chris Bivy. Uh, there's another rally coming up on the 20 Sunday, the 22nd of March. That's at Christ Church, Hampstead, London, 10.30 for a 11 o'clock start. And this is to inform the public not only about the abuse of children, but of course in reference to the Hampstead case, satanic ritual abuse and yes it is real so there we are you can do something particularly if you're in the london area uh, we need people to get out and uh, be seen and counted uh, not just to send emails i was just thinking what is a, a sunday it's quite a quiet area of hampstead but maybe some of the local residents will will pick up on it 
well, on I think, Sunday. I think that's the thing, Louise. The aim is to educate, um, polite, Honestly. reasonable and peaceful. And there could be a service going on at the time at the church. So Indeed. Yeah. Okay. Was... Well, that brings us to the subject of um, obesity. Well, vaccines as well. So they really are trying to pull out all the stops. Public Health England and the Vaccine Advisory Committee have decided that obese people are in um, in the high risk group if they catch flu. Therefore, they're going to be entitled to a free flu jab. So the lucky people now who can go down to their doctors and get a free jab are young children, pregnant women, over 65, people with asthma or heart disease and now obese. Now, when I was pregnant with my children, it was a definite no-no. You do not get vaccine vaccinated or have any injections whilst you are pregnant. And certainly children under the age of two and three should certainly not be given the flu vaccine. But here we are, 2015, and they're pushing it to all the people they're not supposed to be pushing. And I'd just like to highlight the flu jab ingredients here. Uh, many will be able to see formaldehyde in there, uh, aluminium, thermosols, sulfate, thermosols, uh, chicken embryos, to name just a few. So if you're a little bit concerned that your doctors are putting you at risk, by suggesting you have a vaccine, just maybe take the list of ingredients and get the doctor to sign off that all those um, ingredients are safe. Which they Possibly. probably won't. Or probably as safe as this gentleman. Yes. According to this article from Monday, Mr Blair has lost all credibility credibility in the Middle East and that he will be stepping down from his eight year role as envoy and apparently a US official has even described him as a standing joke. Apparently Tony um, has met with John Kerry, US Secretary of State and EU foreign policy boss Frederica Mogherini uh, to discuss a new job. Uh, but a diplomat told the Financial Times that Tony Blair has been ineffective in the job. He has no credibility and is neither an asset nor a liability. He is just not that relevant and is no longer viable. Well, I've just yeah. added a bit to that slide, as we can see some joke, because, of course, if we look at the people who've died or uh, been maimed, injured or psychologically damaged as a result of uh, Tony Blair's unlawful wars. It's not really a joke, very dangerous individual. And we just like to point out for devout Christians, we think this is important that, of course, um, Tony Blair, guest of Nicky Gumbel, the man who created the Alpha course. So we're led to believe that uh, Tony Blair is, of course, a devout Christian. Um, here's Alpha News, if you want to have a look at this yourself. Alpha is probably the most interesting and incredible thing going on in our Christian world. Interview with Tony Blair. Well, we think somebody else is at the back of it and uh, we'll leave you to consider. Uh, well, what are they doing in London with uh, spikes? Yeah, Southern Council has erected giant metal spikes around the Aylesbury housing estate. The fences went up as residents were up in arms after the council closed exit to their homes, allowing them only to leave by a single exit, which was actually then manned by a private security guards. Uh, the enclosed blocks um, are mainly, most of them are vacated because of Southwark Council deciding to regenerate the estate, which is going to cost 1.5 billion. But other residents who've been living there many, many years have decided to stay put. And um, Southwark Council are basically making it as hard and difficult um, for them to be living. Look, what does it look like? Look in this place. It looks like look. a concentration camp, doesn't, doesn't it? Doesn't it just, yeah. So. Well, if uh, we're going to be held inside uh, razor wire, then of course the next thing the state's been doing is uh, spying on us. But this one takes it to a new level, I does. think. does. Thanks, Mike, for pointing this one out to me yesterday. Hertz Rent-A-Car has a system in their vehicles called Never Lost, which is a sat-nav uh, travel guide and a navigational device. But the new addition, the Never Lost 6, has now got the added bonus of a camera and mic, and it's believed the systems can't be turned off. And forums and uh, Twitter uh, people have been going in uproar, basically, that hurts, that there's no way of turning it off. You've got no choice, so everything's going to be filmed. And, and recorded. And anything recorded, you say. anything that recorded in that car. So, so it'll be interesting to see uh, what that does for Hertz is um, rental figures. Yeah, I wonder. Well, if you uh, have ever wondered how policy comes to fruition in the UK and you've noticed that when there's anything important going on, it's never debated in Westminster, just how does policy come into fruition? Well, thank you very much for the person who sent us through an email just pointing at one individual and suggesting that we should have a look into their um, background and the connectivity with a range of other areas. 
Um, we were interested in this because uh, it led us to the path of what's been happening uh, with Britain's nuclear infrastructure, which has effectively been sold on to foreign powers, namely the French and the Chinese. Well, this was the gentleman concerned. Now, of course, we're not saying he's done anything wrong. All we're doing is saying, um, look at the connections and then say, is policy being made in Westminster in a de democratic sense, or is it coming through another route? Well, here's the man, it's Lord Sassoon. Um, he, he's been involved with Jardine Matheson. He's been involved with U UBS Warburg, um, chairman of the China Britain Business Council. Um, commercial secretary to the Treasury. In fact, he's had a number of jobs inside the, tre the Treasury. Uh, special advisor to David Cameron and uh, now into the House of Lords. Uh, so he's been involved with the IF IFS School of Finance, the Merchants Trust, the British Museum, the Global Advisory Board of Mitsubishi, that's the financial group. Uh, also involved with Partnerships UK. Uh, and the Nuclear Liabilities Fund. Now, this was the bit that really interested us because if we take a look at that fund, uh, we can see that it really came out of the Nuclear Generation Decommissioning Fund, uh, which happens to be a limited company registered in Scotland. Uh, it's owned by the Nuclear Trust. Uh, the UK government is a shareholder through the Executive Department of uh, Energy and Climate Change. Uh, it's got five trustees, three appointed by the Secretary of State, and two come from uh, EDF, which is the French energy company, which is now, the, now owns eight British um, nuclear power stations. So very interesting connections there, straight away bringing in the French. Well, of course, Lord Sassoon, uh, they're involved with the China-Britain Business Council, um, do have a look at that and the people involved. Uh, very, very powerful global corporatists and bankers creating good business between China and Britain. Uh, but quite remarkable that David Cameron just happened to think that it was a good idea to get the French involved in taking over our nuclear power plants. And of course, where was the money coming from? Well, it seems to have come from Chinese investors. So we're going to suggest that policy for the sale of Britain's strategic nuclear infrastructure came not from measured debate inside Westminster, but from meetings behind closed doors. If you work in the NHS, let's have a look at how that might affect the NHS. We're simply here looking at the public sector and how the government, the Lib Lab Con in fact, has been selling off our national assets. So enter the Treasury. And uh, what did the Treasury do? It set up a private finance initiative. It then created the Treasury Task Force, five civil servants and eight private executive executives led by Adrian Montague, formerly co-head of Global Project Finance, uh, none other than investment bank Dresner Kleinwart. Well, uh, what did they do? They created a project sec section for PFI. Uh, subsequently, Partnerships UK was uh, created, and we've mentioned Mr. Uh, Sassoon with that. And this was tasked with furthering public-private partnerships in the UK. It was owned by the HM Treasury and uh, private sector. Uh, well, the staffing of that organisation was specifically by private sector procurement specialists, which included corporate lawyers, investment bankers and consultants, and when it had finished its job, uh, all of the facilities uh, were hived off to a local partnership and joint venture with the local government association. Uh, whilst we've now moved on to Infrastructure UK, started on June 2010, where the Treasury and the private sector are going to work on infrastructure projects. And I think we can see, be pretty sure this is where the privatisation of Britain's motorways is coming from nothing to do with uh, policy made in Westminster by your elected MP. These are closed deal, door deals being made with global um, corporate interests. We say it's treason, selling off um, the national uh, infrastructure and public assets to foreign powers in particular is treason, and we stand by that statement. Uh, it's up to uh, our viewers and listeners to get the information out there to the 
wider public. If you think you need a coffee after that, well, you probably won't want to go to Starbucks in America uh, because um, it's just been announced that they're going to be using their staff in order to inform um, customers how what race relations is all about. So you're going to go and get your coffee and you're going to get corporate propaganda and agitation to tell you how to get on with uh, people who may be a different colour from you. Nice. Um, it's pretty nice, isn't yeah, it? No. Well, if that's the state of America at the moment, time to introduce Mark Anderson for an update on what's happening in the States. Well, I'd like to uh, welcome Mark Anderson from American Free Press, who's there in Michigan, ready to speak to us. Are you there, Mark? Yes, sir, Brian. Have a good or good day to you. How's it going? Uh, it's going uh, pretty good for us. Um, now we've got, we've got a good we've got a good uh, line again, so we can see you nice and clearly. Sounds good. So I, I think uh, we should we should have a good interview today. Um, the floor is really yours, but I uh, know that you've been having a look at Senator Cotton, and um, he's been making some quite amazing uh, statements, and and also he's involved in some pretty extraordinary politicking in America. What what are you seeing ar around this man? Well, it's very interesting here. This is one of the more interesting things I've seen in a long time out of the Congress. This newly elected senator, Tom Cotton, spelled like the fabric, a Republican out, out of Arkansas. He's one of your typical onward Christian soldier march, march off into war Christians. And the, the fault can only lie in others. The fault can only lie in Iran if there's going to be trouble on the world stage, especially in the greater Middle East. The U.S. couldn't possibly have any responsibility or culpability in the violence there uh, with its unmanned drone strikes and, and whatnot. But Mr. Cotton and 46 other Republican senators, as is pretty widely known now, signed his name onto an open letter to Iranian officials sort of trying to preempt the ongoing talks in Geneva between the Obama administration and the leaders of Iran to prevent Iran, as they say, from obtaining a nuclear weapon. And what's interesting is now the dusty old Logan Act is being pulled out of the bottom of the barrel of the statute books. You know, this Logan Act goes back to the late 1700s when a a state legislator, a, a state official named Logan, tried to carry on some correspondence with France. And the Logan Act basically says that a private individual in the United States cannot, without the government's permission or without the government's sanction, they cannot carry on diplomacy with foreign leaders. So now Tom Cotton and the 46 others that signed this letter to Iran are being cited. Are they violating the Logan Act or not? And the question is being asked because uh, the letter is basically telling Iran, as soon as Obama is no longer president, whatever nuclear deal Obama made with you is null and void. It's not worth the paper it's printed on. So these warmongers are saying, yeah, you might make an agreement with Obama, but once he's gone, the agreement's gone. And that's how they mean it. So now everybody's letting off uh, you know, fireworks into the air. Oh, it violates the Logan Act. It violates, it violates the Logan Act. Excuse me. And the, the, the Heritage Foundation, though, has argued that it maybe does not uh, violate the Logan Act because it's simply an open letter to these Iranian leaders. It's not a back and forth. And these are, after all, elected U.S. senators. They do have to chime in on treaties and agreements in some way, shape or form under the Constitution. And that may be true. What's probably happening is they walked up to the very edge of violating the Logan Act, but they didn't quite do it. But this brings the Logan Act into sharp focus for Bilderberg. And they're meeting in Austria in early to mid-June in the Tyrolean region in Western Austria. Now we can take this and reorient it where it belongs, and that is Bilderberg. Right. Well, this is extremely interesting. I, I wasn't aware of that um Logan Act, um, but I can see where you're coming from. That we've got one senator, well, uh, and the others that signed the the uh, letter that have been in what we'll call private negotiations. But if we look across the world, we've got all of these other organisations which are clearly 
carrying out politics between nations. You've mentioned the Bilderbergers, but we've got the Trilateral Commission. And, right. then, uh, and then in UK at the moment, we've been having a good look at some of the political organisations that are that are manipulating behind the scenes. We've got the Royal United Services Institute, and we and we've got um, uh, uh, we've got other ones. NTI is one of them, which is looking at nuclear weapons. Uh, where, for example, we've had our former head of the um, intelligence. Uh, committee sitting, rubbing shoulders with Chinese, Russians, uh, United Arab Arama United Arab Emirates, for example. So we mm. see the same thing going on in UK. But you think that the the Logan Act can now put a stop to to the uh, manipulation of some of these organisations? Well, yeah, I, in in so far that Tom Cotton inadvertently has drag the Logan Act out of the dusty law books that it, in which it sits since the late uh, 18th century and has revived discussion of the Logan Act that would never have taken place. The press would never mention the Logan Act. And it much more precisely applies to the Trilateral Commission, to Bilderberg, and to the entities that you mentioned, Brian, because they are corresponding. They're, they are having a back and forth discussion. And with Bilderberg, just for an example, that back and forth discussion with current and former elected U.S. officials, with private citizens in the form of U.S. corporate heads and CEOs, with private individuals in the form of U.S. media moguls and, me and moguls, uh, other, other private U.S. citizens, they are having correspondence with Bilderberg members who include but, but are not limited to public officials of those countries. And they are having correspondence behind closed doors where there is this intercourse. And a, an analysis from the Heritage Foundation in the United States, that's the think tank in Washington, it said that Tom Cotton and the senators are not violating the Logan Act because it's just an open letter and they're elected officials carrying on more or less official duties. Maybe it's a little dis, distasteful. Maybe it's a little ill-timed. Maybe they should have consulted with the president first. But... They're not really having a back and forth correspondence directly or indirectly under the Logan Act. But Bilderberg is and the Trilateral Commission does. John Kerry was at the Trilateral Commission last April in, in Washington, D.C. when they met there as the sitting secretary of state uh, cavorting and, and uh, discussing policy behind closed doors with foreign officials with foreign CEOs included, and a number of others. So, okay, you want to talk about the Logan Act, Washington, we'll talk about it. And it applies plainly to Bilderberg, Trilateral, and these others. Um, many people are just totally unaware these, uh, these discussions uh, go on. I mean, we had the Bilger Bilderberg meeting in, in UK. You were across for that. We had um, mainstream press and media there. But there were still none of the mainstream reports that really got down to the basics of who these people were, what was discussed behind closed doors. And of course, uh, at that uh, Bilderberg meeting here in, here in UK, we had politicians behind closed doors with bankers who we are now seeing with hindsight and the reports of the last 18 months, utterly corrupt, manipulating the interest rates funding drugs um, and the drug barons and simply carrying out fraud on their customers, um, British politicians behind closed doors with those people, and, and yet no real penetrating questions asked. Yeah, very well put, Brian. Uh, it, it dovetails into the whole apparatus of these uh, private groups like Bilderberg and Trilateral. You have bankers meeting with royalty, meeting with oil barons, meeting with politicians past and present. Um, and you have this whole finance minister, prime minister, including David Cameron, having been at Bilderberg in 2013 most recently. I don't know if he was in Denmark last year, right off the top of my head, I don't remember. But the, the bottom line is that with the Logan Act now in the news, we need to apply it where it belongs. And <clears throat> yes, it, it, it affects interest rates and the policies that government officials, finance ministers have interacting with private bankers, central bankers in particular, in talking about interest rates behind closed doors. So now that we have an old law dusted off, 
it's time to apply it where it truly belongs. And that's not so much to Tom Cotton and these other 40-some senators, although that deserves another look. It's really about Bilderberg meeting in Austria this coming June and having met in Denmark last year, the UK the year before. I think their next meeting is their 64th meeting in 61 years, something like that. And it's, it's very important here that we're bringing this out today, and uh, you're to be commended for getting this out there because with Bilderberg just a couple months away, we can really turn up the heat on applying the Logan Act properly so we can tell our current officials, both past and present elected officials, that it's not okay to go behind closed doors and correspond like this because... The law says directly or indirectly carries on any correspondence or intercourse with any foreign government or, or officer or agent thereof. That's how it works. So the Logan Act may be an imperfect law, but we need to apply it where it belongs. Right. Well, Mark, I, I know that uh, you, weren't, you weren't aware of this subject before starting the um the interview, so so I'm delivering this to you cold, but it's absolutely fascinating. I'll just come back to this NTI, Nuclear Threat Initiative, uh, and this is a global initiative. Uh, yes. we, we started looking at it because senior uh, British military people have got very concerned that uh, basically um, uh, they are feeling sidelined over matters of defence. Decisions are being make it, made elsewhere. So NTI, we, we've got Malcolm Rifkin, I mentioned chairman of the British Intelligence and Security Committee. Uh, he's sitting with interesting people. He's there with um, a guy called Ronald Olson, partner of Tollies and Olson LLP. So we, we've got legal companies, we've got banking, uh, we've got bank, bank, bankers, sorry. Uh, we've also got American uh, retired but um, very senior American military personnel. Uh, we've got uh, a Gideon Frank, the former Director General of the Israel Atomic Energy Commission, Malcolm Rifkin himself. All these people meeting behind closed doors to discuss very, very sensitive policy over nuclear weapons. And um, also included on board is the actor Michael Douglas, uh, you can check this for yourself if you go to the uh, NTI website and have a look at the people involved. But you've got a classic example there of people in government, in the military, recently retired from both of those, sitting with bankers and lawyers discussing national policy. And we've, we've been quite astonished to discover this one. And as I say, there's one or two senior military people in UK now beginning to ask the right question, just who is making policy? Is it actually coming through government or is it being done on the sly by these uh, organisations that sound nice until you start to have a look into them? I think you've just been joined there. <laughs> yeah. OK. This moment. Um, yeah, that's another example of private policy making by uh, unaccountable think tanks, which, of yeah. course, in Washington yeah. is all over the place. On Massachusetts Avenue, there's countless think tanks, Brookings Institution, the uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, which is actually uh, often involved in war making policy despite their name. And yeah, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, which has a respectable looking website, uh, they have done maybe some good bean counting in terms of talking about, for instance, Israel's nuclear arsenal being some 400 nuclear weapons. And at the same time, uh, Israel worrying about Iran developing even one possible bomb when Israel has a number of, of those weapons. But that aside, yeah, that, that's another example. And, and I think that that's all gone too far. There's, there's too much emphasis on think tanks and um, private institutions getting too deeply involved in government policymaking. It's one thing to provide a white paper or an advisory paper. It's quite another to uh, you know, directly meet behind closed doors in, in such a ongoing and deep, deep seated fashion. But yeah, the Nuclear Threat Initiative uh, deserves uh, close scrutiny uh, for reasons you just cited. Uh, Mark, um, just um, another, just a short uh, subject, but uh, over the last few days in UK, there's been a huge amount of publicity about the disappearance of Mr. Putin. 
Uh, obviously, he's now re reappeared, but it was extraordinary, the furore in the British press and particularly the BBC, all sorts of theories about where the president had gone and all of it ramping up the idea that uh, Russia was the uh, uh, raging bear that was uh, uh, about to um, invade Western Europe. Um, I've got a report here from Russia today, uh, which is um, uh, showing um, 100 US armored vehicles rolling into Latvia. So there's been a lot of movement of uh, military in Eastern Europe. Uh, this was part of it. Um, can I just ask what, um, how are things seen at the moment in, in uh, the States with regard to Russia? Are you seeing this same rhetoric uh, coming out that um, Putin is, is, uh, is the mad ruler who is uh, gonna murder us in our beds? If, if you listen to Washington think tanks and you, and you listen to many congressmen, the answer is yes. They, they have the same heated rhetoric that Putin can't be trusted. He's trying to take the former Soviet states and reestablish the Russian bear, kind of reassemble the Soviet Union, as it were. Uh, you get outside of the Beltway, get outside of Washington, and I think you have a lot of very baffled Americans. Uh, the, the media lies are so consistent and the exaggerations are so consistent that the average American, if they don't just accept the government line because it's easier to do, then they simply don't know what to think. Uh, they're, they're very confused because they're not getting the truth. Uh, no one is saying Putin is an angel, but... He rationally wants to avoid war with the United States, which is, of course, now the world empire that Britain once was. And we seem to just attack anyone that doesn't want to fall in line with the monopoly capitalist neoliberal system. And so Putin is trying to be just a, a wise and, and prudent and careful uh, diplomat uh, and avoid any uh, incendiary rhetoric. Uh, these uh, reports that he disappeared were obviously bogus. Um, in some way, shape, or form. I didn't see many of those because oftentimes I could kind of sense they were just tripe or propaganda put out there. But uh, yeah, I'm, we're seeing the same thing here that um, at least in government and many of the think tanks that we have to arm Ukraine against Putin. Otherwise, Putin's going to run over Ukraine like a bulldozer and reassemble the Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll just give you this bit, and, and then I know you wanted to uh, just have a comment about 9-11 matters, but uh, we, we had a report over the last few days that British Prime Minister David Cameron was calling on the military police uh, to protect him, and uh, we were also told that uh, there were going to be service men and women called up from the Royal Navy to be trained in close protection for our Prime Minister. And our comment on this is uh, we wondered what was frightening him. Was it the fact that British voters are waking up to his policies or has he been a bit of a naughty boy in Russia? Um, because it's uh, it's quite clear that uh, there's been all sorts of manoeuvrings going on behind the scenes. But I just thought you'd be interested and America, ultimately American audience would be interested that uh, uh, David Cameron, British Prime Minister, seems to well, he's not sleeping too well, apparently. Yeah, I, you know, you'd have to uh, enlighten me a little bit. What is he so afraid of, simply put? what What's what's the deal? Uh, well, I mean, I can, why all the security? Sorry, I can say that one of the things is, of course, that whilst David Cameron stands on the world stage ramping up the rhetoric against uh, President Putin and, and the threat from Russia, uh, what he's, what Cameron has been doing with the other hand is absolutely cutting Britain's military to the bone. So on one hand, he says we're in a very vulnerable position because Russia is so dangerous. With the other hand, he's uh, he's been cutting the military to the bone. The British military is now second rate. I, I can absolutely say that with no disrespect to people serving. Um, and uh, there's a lot of disgruntled um, senior people in Britain at the moment. So... Uh, it could just be that he's uh, getting worried about uh, the British military or what's left of it. Yeah, pretty hypocritical. He wants to protect himself, but not the country. And maybe some of it, if I may speculate, and this is pure speculation, is, you know, oh, Russia's so bad that I have to have this extra security, almost a way of amplifying the Russian threat and at the same time selfishly protecting himself more than the nation overall. Well, that's usually the policy of dictators. <laughs> 
Yeah. OK, well, I, I yeah. know that you wanted to just say a couple of words about uh, Judy Wood, who I believe has got a march in Texas. Is that right? Yeah, she actually just wrapped up a program in Texas at Brenham College near Houston, Sunday, March 15. And I mention it because I've corresponded with Dr. Judy Wood on 9-11. And I'm not a 9-11 reporter per se, but I have followed it since 2006. And I've seen a lot of theories, a lot of ideas of what physically happened in New York and Washington, D.C. that day, 9-11 of 2001. And I would call attention to uh, a link that um, we can maybe make available. But her talk in Texas this past Sunday is available online through a, a journalistic contact named Ron Avery. And it's a live stream, and it's, you can watch it on the archive um, after the fact. And it's just very interesting in that it tells a whole new narrative about what, have, what may have happened on 9-11. And what's most interesting is it suggests that a, a form of exotic weaponry was used and that the standard government story of 19 box cutters and the alternative news story, the alternative story of thermite and thermate and explosives planted throughout the building, uh, it's possible that those are both false stories uh, kind of put out there as a, like a false polarity. In other words, if you don't believe one falsehood, you've got another fairy tale waiting for you in the wings. And what she does is cut through the bull, in my opinion, and show that uh, the buildings actually disappeared, turned to dust in midair. And it's very, very compelling, the interest. The, the, excuse me, the evidence behind this, that the buildings basically came apart at the molecular level. And my last comment would be you have two 500,000 ton buildings, and as they disappear or disintegrate or dustify, as she says it, there isn't uh, one million tons of, of uh, matter on the ground. When you have a normal demolition, if you have a million tons standing, after it blows up, you have a million tons of debris laying there. That's not the case. Most of the debris was literally gone. So her book is called Where Did the Towers Go? And that's very appropriately titled, Where Did They Go? And I would just, as a veteran journalist, I'm putting that out there to, to get people to listen to this angle and to strongly consider it above and beyond what they may have heard so far over the years on 9-11. Okay, well... Um Mark, thank you very much for that. I, I do find the subject of the Twin Towers very interesting. I've, I've heard, I have read a, a little bit of her material. I'm very open-minded. Uh, but of course, uh, what we do know for a fact is that the moment that incident took place, in came all of the, uh, the trouble with terrorism across the world. And that's led us to the precarious state we are at the moment with, with devastation everywhere from Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, uh, and now Syria, of course. We'll have okay. to talk about this more. Okay, very good. Okay, well, I'm going to thank you for joining us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. And uh, take care there in Michigan. Yeah, you too. Thanks for having me on, Brian. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So very interesting report from Mark Anderson. And, of course, what he's showing there is that the American... Uh, the Americans are also starting to look at putting curbs on people producing uh, policy behind closed doors. Bilder Bilderberg is being specially mentioned. Uh, well, what do we need to do here in UK? We're going to say, um, have a look at what the British Constitution Group has been up to. And we're pleased to say that the video, the first video uh, on the grand jury, which was a key part of the uh, BCG Spring Conference, is now out so do have a look at that and of course we weren't just talking we did actually form four grand juries in order to look at how matters could be progressed and uh, child abuse was one of those juries so do have a look at that John Hurst um, bottom right and Strider top left who were who did the bulk of the work in putting that section together Amazing so amount of work. well done you guys and uh, you can pick up other videos by going to the British Constitution Group uh, website. And uh, we hope, hope you'll do that and have a look at the uh, full range of speakers. And become a member of the BCG if you're not already. Indeed. Maybe. Yeah. Okay, well, what have we got here? Cops. More cops. 
Former District Police Commander for Thurrock, Ben Hodder, appeared in court last Friday after pleading guilty for making indecent images of children. Um, really, that's all I can tell you at the moment. Sentencing is going to be on the 17th of April and uh, we will update you with more. Maybe if you're in the Essex area, you might want to go down to the court. I mean, just police, isn't it? Police, well, judges, I think it's, royal family. I think it's very interesting that, of course, the attack is being turned on the police now. So we still haven't got any signs of Britain's politicians who are involved in paedophilia coming into court. But Theresa May, as we'll see, is already attacking the police. Uh, but as you say, what have the judges been up to? And uh, yeah. looking at porn, basically. Yeah. Yesterday afternoon, a story broke of how three judges were sacked and a fourth resigned after they were caught viewing porn on court, court computers. Now, uh, I took a quick look to see if I could find any pictures of the four who had judged Tim Bowles of Romford, uh, Warren Grant, Peter Bullock and an Andrew Moore. Um, I couldn't find any details at all of Tim Bowles, um, but there were a couple of photos scattered around of the others. Now, there's no details of what the dirty judges were viewing and... Um, it's not yet has been basically it's not been leaked, um, but it does really. But it doesn't matter. What matters is that uh, how anyone can expect to get a fair trial in these courts when the judges are nothing more than. Well, this yeah. has been brought up, hasn't it, with this um, this one here from the Telegraph, yeah. where they're saying um, could criminals now challenge their conviction because yes. the judges. Well, it's basically it's the aftermath of the scandal, um, and it can lead. It could be leading to doors opening for criminals to have their convictions overturned, as they could say that evidence heard during one of the trials may actually not have been heard as the judge was too busy viewing indecent material uh, whilst the hearing was in progress. So these are the pieces we, we should trust. Just leave it on the screen, if you will, Nick, for, for a minute, because we did hear some good news, which we'll pass on. And apparently the British public has voted to outlaw battery hen farms. It's pretty cruel to keep these chickens in this sort of condition, isn't it, really? I'm not allowed to show emotion, so <laughs> no, no comment. This, this is true. Well, we're a bit of black humour in here, but these people, of course, putting themselves forward to be the upholders of morality, standards in law. And, of course, what are they doing? They're showing themselves, uh, well, actually worse than the, the uh, common criminal because uh, the common criminal is carrying out a criminal act as a criminal, these judges, of course, in their pinstripe suits, pretending that uh, they are squeaky clean and should be ruling the rest of us. Uh, maybe they should be popped into a battery. But yeah, that's, that's better for them, definitely. Uh, well, let's have a look at this because um, the good old BBC, what did they do? Well, they used their, um, uh, they used their um, legal correspondent in order to defend the judges. Uh, so Clive Coleman, had uh, reported in an article, there's no suggestion that any of the SAC judges did anything illegal in accessing pornography via their judicial computers. Had they done the same thing at home, there would have been little basis for dismissing them. This is purely a question of misconduct and the misuse of judicial IT accounts paid for by the taxpayer. To which we say, well, a typical BBC reply, BBC can't even get to grips with paedophiles and Jimmy Savile in its own organisation. Uh, no, it's not just a question of misconduct. This is misconduct in public office. These people should be put in prison. Um, the last thing we need is uh, the BBC apologising for them. And then, of course, we had this gentleman, Peter Henley, uh, from the BBC, and he basically said, well, one BBC reporter being pulled off a child abuse uh, story. We get so, so many, um, you know, uh, we get dozens of stories for each one that goes on air. So here's, here's yet another callous BBC opinion. We don't really care how many child abuse stories they are. We just pick the ones we want to go for and, and we're not really interested in the rest. They're, they're, <laughs> they're just sickening, these people. And, um, well, here she is, um, Theresa May, uh, in the opinion of the UK column, the most dangerous lady in Britain. Um, now, Metropolitan Police Chiefs of Bernard Hogan House facing a probe over the child abuse cover-up. Notice this word probe. This is nothing to do with serious investigations. This is a few policemen shuffling a piece of paper, a few pieces of paper to see whether perhaps something's done, uh, something's been done wrong. And let's have a look at the words of Theresa May. 
Uh, she confirmed that there seems to have been a cover up at Scotland Yard over VIP child abuse and said officers may face charges. Then listen to this. The Home Secretary told the Home Affairs Committee there needs to be no suggestion of any further cover up in the work of an investigation of what seems to have been a cover up. Uh, I'll just read that again. Seriously? There needs to be no suggestion of any further cover up in the work of an investigation of what seems to have been a cover up. And while you're digesting that uh, gobbledygook, uh, we have uh, the fact that she's um, also mentioned uh, Justice Lowell Goddard. This is the New Zealand establishment judge who's been um, who's been brought in to uh, presumably help with another cover up. Um, that uh, would not want anything it does to potentially jeopardise investigations that could lead to criminal prosecutions. So what they've done here very uh, cleverly is they are now turning the accusation back on the police. So, of course, we know that there has been a cover up by police officers. So who does Theresa May now threaten uh, with prison police officers? Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, of course, her job is to make sure that uh, nobody who's in the establishment or Westminster uh, comes near a trial of any description. Can I just give a bit of info out there for viewers and listeners if they want to do a bit of research? It is believed that Lowell Goddard's first husband was very is an English lord and was very, very close to Camilla and Charles. Therefore, her not having links to any establishment is what she went in front of Parliament and said. That yeah. would be... A lie. A chant, wait, so what? it's a challenge for people. If you can go and find any information out there, it is rumoured her first husband was very close to Prince Charles and Camilla back in the day. And Miss Goddard is is apparently so ill-informed, in fact, many would say ignorant, that she also claims she, she, she didn't even know what the establishment was. So, I don't know, too much time in New Zealand, I think. But have a look at this man because he's uh, working very hard to make sure that none of the abusers at high level are brought to justice. So a big boast that the NHS has paid out 12 million for sex abuse of patients within the NHS in 20 years. Uh, and this has come to light as the first of Savile's victims are receiving compensation. Uh, we say what this man is really saying is never mind what's happened. Let's buy off the victims using public money bury the whole thing and then of course we can protect the paedophiles. Have they got gagging orders attached to when these when they get these payouts do you think? Well we don't know in this case Louise but of course we know in many other cases that uh, the payments were made with gagging orders right. and uh, it gets better let's come to the Plymouth Herald uh, because um, uh, a number of people are getting upset that uh, Devon and Cornwall police haven't adopted Operation Encompass uh, the headline, three more police forces launch Plymouth-born child safeguarding scheme while Devon and Cornwall police ignore it. Now, of course, the headline uh, omits the fact that this scheme was in fact created by a Devon and Cornwall police officer, uh, but we should be trusting the police to uh, safeguard our children. Well, have a look at this uh, Plymouth Herald article uh, where a former detective um, Shirley Thompson had this to say. Reading the newspapers today was like a repeat of what I saw with the paedophile goad. Officers being told to stop investigating, told to ignore evidence, and young men being left to be abused by others. This is what goad's victims said for years. It's what I was told during the inquiry. Put a lid on it and concentrate on goad. So here is a former Devon and Cornwall uh, detective Shirley Thompson and what a brave lady because she's saying that uh, senior Devon and Cornwall police officers uh, stopped evidence coming forward wow. with regard to abuse and she was told to put a lid on it. So um, who is the best pe person to look after your children? We're going to suggest it's you and uh, uh, something really needs to be done now about the fact we can clearly see uh, police forces across the country covering up child abuse and indeed protecting paedophiles. Yeah. Uh, I was told earlier today that, of course, many of the police are desperately frightened now because of this business, that if they go to prison, not only as a paedophile, but also as a former police officer, 
their physical safety in grave doubt. So meanwhile, um, David Cameron, Theresa May, done absolutely nothing to protect Britain's children. But of course, they've done a huge amount to help protect um, former colleagues who are guilty of child abuse. Chris Bivy, Friday, we'll do another reminder tomorrow, but tonight's UK Column monthly meetup is not at the George. Uh, Brian's going to be giving a talk at Thrive Caf Thrive on, on 4th Street in Totnes, which is the high street, slap bang in the middle of the high street. Um, and what time is it all starting? 7.30 till 10.30. It won't be talking for all that time. Of course, there's opportunity for everybody to meet, mix and chat and also to have some fun while we do serious business. Yep, so that's the Thrive Caf on uh, 4th Street, which is Tottenham High Street, tonight at uh, 7.30. And lastly, for those of you asking, I'm expecting to get an update on Melanie Shaw this afternoon, and then we will, of course, relay that information. But yes, UK Column team desperately concerned about what's happening with uh, Melanie, and we are keeping a very sharp eye on what's happening around the two children in the Hampstead case, and we will have more to say on that over the coming days. So if you can uh, support um, at the London end around Hampstead or Mr Spivy, please do. We need people to get out there and be counted. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.